Managing student behavior is a challenge, regardless of the setting, but managing scores of children while driving a 13-ton vehicle presents a challenge not everyone can handle successfully. On top of that, there's a rising concern about school violence and the safety of our students and employees. There is hope and movement to turn around the staggering rise of youth violence. As educators, we refuse to feel hopeless, and it's not in our collective or personal nature to feel hopeless. As we learn more strategies in student discipline, we take yet another step in the process to detect and prevent school violence. On February 11, 1988, while working at a Florida high school as an assistant principal, Dr. Nancy Blackwelder, a fellow administrator and a teacher, fell victim to two gun-wielding students which rocked the educational community. After her recovery, she recognized the need to evaluate school district's training programs and use the knowledge gained through her experience to help other educators. Dr. Blackwelder is an articulate speaker with experience as a teacher and as an assistant principal at both the elementary and high school levels, an assistant director of transportation, and an administrator in the special needs student education department. Tomorrow, we hope that you'll return to your jobs and use the strategies you learn today and feel that powerful sense of assurance that comes when you know you have the tools in place to ensure that your buses and schools are safe and happy havens for everyone. Hi, I'm Nancy Blackwelder, and as a former teacher and assistant principal at both the elementary and the high school levels, and as a director of transportation in a very large school district of over 100,000 students, 140 some odd schools, over 600 school bus routes, I realized that when I came from the instructional side of the house to the supported services side of the house, that the vast majority of training that we did for school bus drivers was how to drive the truck. And we gave them precious little, if any, information on how to deal with children. Now, it's no surprise to you that dealing with children is half the battle. So I have developed some instructional training for bus drivers because I just don't think it's fair to send somebody out on the street with a bunch of kids without giving them the tools they need to be successful in that environment. It's like handing them the torch of education flame first. So this instructional series that I'm going to produce is all about how drivers get into trouble. We want to get that bus environment to such a state that our drivers have the best chance of staying out of trouble. What we will cover in program two is concealed weapons on the bus, displayed weapons on the bus, and warning signs of students who may become violent. Laws mandate that school districts develop crisis plans which cover incidents that may occur on campus. Lockdown drills, code words for the intercom, and procedures for teachers to follow are spelled out in detail. Unfortunately, there isn't always the same due diligence spent on procedures for the school buses. Bus drivers need to know where students hide weapons and drugs and make them aware of weapons that they may not even consider a weapon, so they have the best chance of staying out of trouble. Here's our first headline. Alabama student arrested for bringing handgun on the bus. Well, what exactly happened? A student from Baldwin County High School was arrested by the police last week after he brought a handgun onto a school bus. He reportedly showed the firearm to middle school students while on the bus. The student who saw the gun reported the incident to police who arrested the student and confiscated the handgun. So where are weapons concealed? I'm Michael Dorn, Chief of Police for the Bibb County Public School System in Macon, Georgia. I want to talk to you today about weapons in schools, how students and non-students alike uh, bring weapons in the school, how they carry them, how they conceal them, some of the different types of weapons that we find in a school setting. 
Uh, in Bibb County, we've had a, a tremendous reduction of more than 70% in weapons violations through a comprehensive weapons screening program, the uh, core of which is metal detection program. Uh, we're going to talk about why programs like this are necessary in schools, private schools, public schools all across the country, you know, why they're experiencing these problems. Uh, to give a, a grasp of that, uh, how wide the problem is, we've been, uh, I've personally been asked to come and train more than 2,000 police officers and educators just in the last three or four years uh, from across the United States and overseas. We've given training and technical assistance to police agencies in Alaska, Maine, Massachusetts, Florida, Texas, all across the country, uh, small towns and big cities alike who've had these problems. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a problem that we face uh, just about everywhere in the country and it seems to be in many areas uh, escalating. Uh, first we want to talk about the items that, that, that we might see right in front of us that um, might be a weapon and we might not realize it if we, if we don't know what we're looking for. Uh, items such as these brass knuckles that are designed uh, to look like cosmetic jewelry uh, that a teacher or administrator might see a child wearing and, and not realize that this is actually a very dangerous weapon that can be used to uh, inflict a lot, of, a lot of damage. Very frequently, in fact more frequently, that it'll be seen with a two or three uh, finger version instead of the full four finger version so it's not quite so conspicuous uh, but as, as in many states in Georgia that's a felony for a student or anybody to possess on a school ground. Might be items like ballpoint pens that are commercially available. This pen writes but it also has a surgical steel uh, blade in excess of three inches uh, that can be purchased for, for less than seven dollars. Also uh, another version and this one we actually took off one of our students a few years ago uh, is in just another type with a, with a surgical steel blade. The good thing about items like this is if you have a good comprehensive weapon screening program and the kids see that you're really concerned for their safety, when a student has something like this, they'll often want to show it to other students. If the students see that this, the administration cares about weapons in school, they'll report this type of violator to you. Uh, we also have items uh, in a variety of commercially available uh, commonly seen containers like this oil can that have been modified to uh, commercially to hide drugs, money, uh, weapons, and other things from school officials. Uh, normally this will be in a vehicle, but sometimes in a girl's pocketbook, hairspray, soft drinks, anything you can think of, they'll take a container and modify it uh, and, and people can buy it to, to hide these items from us. This is another good uh, reason why we want to use canines. Uh, when possible to search because they're not fooled by this. They're, they're looking for the odor and they'll find it. Items like a, a textbook that can be modified uh, with a cutout to contain a handgun or, or drugs or another type of weapon. And this is why in our, in our search strategy we need to be sure that we inspect book bags, pocket books, and textbooks themselves. Uh, doing away with book bags has helped some systems but we don't want to presume that just because the students don't have a book bag that they can't find the other way around uh, that to hide a weapon. Items like this uh, working umbrella with a screw out push dagger that uh, I was able to purchase mail order for uh, about $12 and could easily be carried into a school if people didn't know what they were looking for. This sword came with a rather long blade. This is another version of the sword cane that uh, unscrews to reveal a rather long spike type blade. This cane right here uh, doesn't have any kind of con hidden compartments or, or blades or anything, but what it does have is a, is a very heavy dog's head on the end. It could, uh, crush a human skull without much effort at all. So we want to be aware of something like this it might uh, look like an ornamental thing or what have you, but we have to ask ourselves why would a student bring an item to school like this and, and look beyond what it appears to be and, and make sure we're, we know exactly what we're dealing with. Now I want to talk about where people hide weapons on them and I particularly in this situation I've dressed like a gang member uh, for one of our local groups now they can't dress like this in our schools because we do have uniforms in place uh, to prevent that but I want to show why uh, school uniforms or strict dress code can be so important simple things like making students tuck in uh, their shirt to keep them from hiding a weapon like this Glock pistol which has been easily concealed up under my t-shirt simply by sticking it down in my waistband one gun's not enough for you. Maybe another little 380 semi-automatic. This one uh, we took off of an individual who was a gang member uh, cruising near our schools. It's even got his gang name etched into the slide, a little 380 semi-automatic pistol. 
Another uh, little 38 special, charter arms revolver, little five shot pistol, easily concealed in my waistband. Items like this collapsible baton, easily stuck down in my waistband. Uh, this is actually was taped to my stomach up under the t-shirt, a little shirking or throwing star martial arts device. And, uh, for those in the martial arts, we also have the nunchuck, the nunchuck. Um, an ice pick concealed in the waistband. I haven't made the point yet about how easy it is to hide something in the waistband. Let's move to something a little bit more substantial, like this submachine gun that with the magazine out can easily be hidden up under the t-shirt. Now this one, uh, someone on a traffic stop uh, tried to produce this to shoot one of my police officers. And at the time, they had it rigged with a short shoulder strap to allow it to be worn over the arm and under a jacket and be easily concealed. So it's, it's not far-fetched to talk about how it can be concealed like that because it actually was set up for that. If I still haven't made the point about waistbands, we can go to something just a little bit heavier, this little shotgun. And this one is actually a lot longer than it needs to be. It could be sawed off from here to about here and still be quite functional at about half the length of what I have now. Now that pretty well eliminates what I've got in my waistband, but there's a lot of other places that we can carry weapons. Uh, most commonly, we're going to find that to be in the pockets, you know, something like a simple little pocket knife. Another gun, you never have too many in a gunfight. Set of metal knuckles. Another small pocket knife. Another little bitty pocket knife, which, while we're on that topic, most school administrators, parents, and students understand that if we have a weapon like this in a school, that it's a very serious concern. Uh, very frequently across the country, students will be prosecuted and expelled for an item like this. But this is where we fall down. We look at pocket knives and small knives, and many times people don't take them seriously. Well, most commonly, when you do have an aggravated assault or a serious weapons assault in school, it's going to be an item like a small pocket knife or a box cutter and because they're most prevalent and carried because society doesn't realize how serious that is. If a student shows up with this, every student understands that that's wrong. Every uh, parent, every school is going to have some sense uh, of being in the same train of thought that this is a serious problem. But when we get into items like this, we often waffle. And it's very uh, cruel to our children to do that. We need to make sure that they understand that this is a weapon just like this is a weapon, and they will all be dealt with very seriously. Neither has a place in our schools. And in reality, while this is more deadly in a confrontation, this is where most of the confrontations are happening because these items are so much more frequently carried by students. Uh, this item right here, I know you'll find this hard to believe, but this is just uh, ordinary lip balm. Okay. Another small uh, knife here in the other pocket. Another, another small little favorite pocket knife. A set of metal knuckles. Now we go to the back pocket. Now unfortunately these pants only have one back pocket so it limits the number of things I can carry. But first we'll start with a typical police officer's checkbook. As we can see there's very little money in here. But we do have a handy little dagger with a three and a half inch blade. It's very flat and easy to conceal. Uh, razor blades and, and other flat types of knives are often stored in wallets and checkbooks. Uh, let's see, we have a little pen gun. It's not very accurate. It's only good for one shot, but can be very deadly and easily overlooked by somebody that does not know what they're looking for. This is another reason why we urge that trained police officers and security personnel uh, who've got experience with these matters be used to conduct weapon screening so they know what they're, what they're looking at when someone tries to sneak an item like this by. Uh, trusty little coubaton here uh, would be normally hooked to a keychain, and somebody might think, well, that's just a keychain. Well, it's used as a striking weapon as it is. It can do quite a bit of damage to somebody, but it can also very quickly be brought into play by unscrewing it and screwing it back into the handle. Uh, this reveals uh, more than a three-inch blade. This is extremely sharp, uh, very deadly type of fighting knife. And again, easily available to our kids. Another just a plain plastic coubaton. This is a, a hairbrush type device. Uh, that's actually manufactured this way. If you take the side plate off, you see two razor blades. Uh, this is another way that a child might try to bring uh, an item to school. And again, you know, just this simple little razor blade uh, can be a, a dangerous item. Okay. Butterfly knife or Bailey song. 
A uh, very effective type of knife normally will be carried in this position here, and a lot of people may see that and not realize that that's a, that's a knife. It's a very common type of fighting knife, very popular. Another set, these are brass knuckles. And I've got a set of aluminum knuckles, not very, not very heavy. That pretty well ends up in my pockets and everything. Now, where else could I possibly have a weapon? Well, a shoulder holster might hide another six-shot 38 Special Revolver. We have here another popular means to carry a weapon. Uh, different types of weapon just strung around the neck to place uh, this five-shot 22 Revolver down in the front chest area. Uh, so it's important if we're doing metal detection that we pass the detector across open areas where we might not normally expect to find a weapon because that may be a place that they're going to hide a weapon. Uh, another popular means to, to hide a weapon may be to tape uh, an item like a dagger or a firearm to someone's arm or leg or to the abdomen. This is not normally going to be the way that somebody's going to carry a weapon all day, uh, but if they're going to carry it for a short period of time, they may do that. Uh, just about any place that we can think of, we can, we can hide a weapon. Uh, now we're going to move down to the lower, lower part of my body. Uh, sometimes the gang members like to roll up one pant leg to show gang affiliation. And uh, one problem with this is rolled cuffs uh, can be easily used to, to hide a weapon. Um, in the sock, we can have particularly items like this box cutter concealed down into the sock. In shoelaces, I can hide a knife in my shoelaces. I can hide a little bit bigger knife down on the side of my shoe. And again, when we're using a metal detector, we need to be sure that we're also covering the, the feet. Now, I'm not going to bother for purposes of this demonstration, but another way to hide a weapon is under the, the bottoms of the feet and the bottom of the shoe. I've got one up here, a little dagger taped uh, on the back of my spine behind my neck. Move over to the other side, and again, you can hide some things here. One more handgun just stuck up in the sock. And again, uh, a student's not normally going to be able to hide a gun there all day unless they've got tight-fitting socks, but it's, it's one way to get a gun into a school if we're not checking those type of areas. A uh, knife kept down in the socks, a uh, rather long fillet knife. One more small pocket knife laced down uh, into my shoe. Again, a very small blade, but that can be very deadly in a confrontation. The point I'm trying to make here is, is not that somebody's going to walk into your school uh, with an arsenal like this, although there has been at least one case that I'm familiar with where, where that did happen, uh, where a student brought 97 pounds of weapons into a school. That, that's actually a very, very unusual situation. The point I do want to make is that if I can hide all of this in, in warm dress summer clothing uh, without being overly obvious about it, then it should be fairly easy for me to hide this up under my waistband and come into a school and, and a terrible situation to result. And again, that's why we need to become educated about the types of weapons that uh, young people might bring into our schools. And that's why we need to take a very close look at our security procedures. Are we doing something to keep these type of weapons uh, out of our school setting? Are we doing what we need to do to protect our students and our faculty and our staff? Because if students know that these type of items are in the school, they don't learn like they should learn. Our teachers don't teach like they should teach. So we need to be sure that we're, we're uh, creating a caring environment for our students by keeping these types of items and other contraband out of our schools. Thank you. We've examined what to do if there is a concealed weapon on the bus, but what should you do if there is a displayed weapon? This unit is intended to spur discussion about what a prudent adult should do in this situation. Here's our first headline, shooting on board Philly school bus possibly result of bullying. The shooting happened on the bus in West Philadelphia just after 8 a.m. The 15-year-old brought a gun for protection from the older teen who had a history of bullying the younger boy. Gunfire rang out after the 17-year-old victim got into a fight with a 15-year-old. 
The 15-year-old alleged shooter then pointed the gun in the driver's face and fled the bus. Here's another headline, raw video. Teen girl draws gun on school bus. So with a displayed gun, what can you do? Well, first, try to remain calm. Don't be a hero. Verbally attempt to de-escalate. Don't try to physically disarm the gunman. And if the student attempts to leave the bus, let him or her go. Each time there is a shooting, an in-depth study is conducted on the perpetrator. Investigators talk to the relatives, the teachers, the friends, and when you get all the pieces of the puzzle together, in retrospect, someone always says, the warning signs were all there. It's a shame no one noticed. This unit focuses on what to look for in a child that may go off and become violent. If a young person displays more than four of the following behaviors, they may need help. If they have a change in behavior, whether it's over time or in the course of a day, has a history of tantrums and uncontrollable angry outbursts, characteristically resorts to name calling, cursing, and abusive language, displays cruelty to animals. We know there's a huge correlation between those who will be cruel to animals and those who will graduate to the human animal. Is preoccupied with weapons, explosives, and other incendiary devices. Has a background of serious disciplinary problems at school and in the community. Has a background of drug, alcohol, or other substance abuse or dependencies is on the fringe of his or her peer group with few or no close friends, has previously been truant, suspended, or expelled from school, has little or no supervision and support from parents or a caring adult, has witnessed or been a victim of abuse or neglect in the home. We know that violence is a learned behavior, has been bullied and are bullies or intimidates peers or younger children. Tends to blame others for difficulties and problems that he or she causes him or herself. Consistently prefers TV shows, movies, or music expressing violent themes and acts. Prefers reading materials dealing with violent themes, rituals, and abuse reflects anger, frustration, and the dark side of life in school essays or writing projects, is involved with a gang or an antisocial group on the fringe of peer acceptance, 
is often depressed or has significant mood swings, has threatened or attempted suicide, has previously brought a weapon to school, and habitually makes violent threats when angry. Let's watch a story about a kid who had warning signs that weren't picked up on. I just remember hearing that sound. You heard boom. These kids come running in, saying he got a gun, he got a gun. I was like, who? And then one kid shouted out, your brother, even. Josh looked at him and he said, what do you have a gun for? And then unclipped the safety and shot Josh. Someone said, my brother got shot. Josh has been shot, and I'm like, what? Josh went down, gripping his stomach. I'm hit, I'm hit. I took two people's lives. There was no reason to do it. No, there was no real reason to kill somebody. On February 19, 1997, 16-year-old Ivan Ramsey brought a gun to school and shot and killed classmate Josh Palacios and Principal Ron Edwards. Although school violence has been on the decline in recent years, rates are still much higher than they were 20 years ago. And last year, there were an unprecedented four multiple victim shootings at schools across the U.S. Acts of violence, large and small, stem from people in pain. We all want to help troubled friends before anyone gets hurt, but it's hard to know how to intercede. This show will help you with the first step, looking for and acting on the warning signs. Every school has its standouts, and at Bethel High School, Josh Palacios was exactly that. With his big smile and confident air, Josh was often the center of attention. He was really, he was really cool. He, he was popular, everybody liked him. Great at sports and stuff, and good with girls. What do people generally think of either? Um, kind of shy, kind of weird. He didn't stand out to me any. Growing up wasn't easy for Ivan. When he was six years old, his father went to jail for 10 years for felony assault. Soon thereafter, his mother started drinking heavily and the state deemed her unfit to care for her family. Ivan and his two brothers were then placed in a series of foster homes where they claimed they were sometimes neglected and abused. And by the time Ivan was a teenager, he was already prone to small violent outbursts himself. There's really no single trait that helps us to understand uh, who will behave violently and who won't behave violently. It's really a combination of things. But the things we do know are that violence is a learned behavior. So kids who have been exposed to violence in the home are more likely to behave violently than those that haven't. One of the things Ivan says pushed him over the edge was the constant teasing and harassment he received at school from kids like Josh Palacios. People would call me a retard, tell me I'm stupid. Those times would, uh, I mean, his friends would uh, throw, I guess they were wads of toilet paper at me, and they just, they thought that was hilarious. One of the warning signs uh, for young people who behave violently is uh, having been a victim of bullying at uh, some point in their prior life. Josh's sense of humor is kind of, I mean, sometimes they'd be cutting, you know? Like, he'd make fun of you, but I mean, he's still your friend, and just most people just laughed it off. After all this shit happened to him, he just got a bad temper. You know, anybody said something to him, teased him or anyone, he'd get pissed. Had things been sort of building up the weeks before you committed the crime? I had a girlfriend at the time, and she said, goodbye, no more you, pretty much. And there's everybody messing with me. So what did you do? I'm telling the adult figures, people in the authority, and they tell me, hey, just ignore it. So you can only ignore something for so long. And then? Ignoring them won't make them go away. How did the idea 
to go into school with a gun began? It began by, I want to kill myself. I wanted to uh, come and show people, hey, it's, it's what you guys drove me to. But when Ivan told two 14-year-old friends about his plan to kill himself, he says they urged him towards a different end. They had uh, people they had a disliking toward. And so I guess they said, well, okay, well, if you're going to do this, then why don't you shoot this person, that person, that person, that person. Ivan was the one who pulled the trigger, but the two friends who he says egged him on were also charged with murder. While both denied the allegations and denied ever naming people to shoot, one pled guilty to a lesser charge and was released into the custody of his parents. The other was convicted of second-degree murder and is currently serving time in a juvenile center until he turns 19. What was on your mind that morning? I'm gonna do this. I went downstairs. Put the shells in my pocket, got the gun, put it in my pant leg, and I went to the bus stop, got to school, and went through the entrance, took my hat off, took my coat off, pulled the shotgun out. Took a second and I checked out everybody. I was just sitting there, talking. Someone noticed a van was a couple steps up with a shotgun. Someone said, uh, just an ROTC gun. We didn't think it was real or something. Josh got up again and, and he like looked at him and he said, what do you have a gun for? And then just turned toward him, turned toward us and uh, unclicked the safety and shot Josh. And he was, he was just pacing back and forth with the gun. She said, give me the gun. And I said, sure, here. And that's the first time we actually really pointed it at me. And then Mr. Edwards had come out and Ivan saw him. Ivan ran forward from this corner, shot him. Mr. Edwards hit the door and fell into it as the bullet hit him. And he started putting the gun under his chin. That was one of the things that I told her. I could kill myself. I could kill myself right now. But when the police finally stormed into the school and exchanged gunfire with Ivan, he decided he didn't want to die after all and threw down his gun. Looking back, there were warning signs that Ivan was planning an act of extreme violence. They just weren't recognized in time. The Monday before this happened, and um, I went up to him and I said, what are you going to do about this layout problem right here? You know, do that. And he goes, I don't care. I said, well, what are you going to do about this copy you need to write over here? And he goes, I don't care. When a young person all of a sudden doesn't care or want to do the kinds of activities that they've always been invested in, that ought to be seen as a warning sign that something is going on here, something is wrong. In the days before the shooting, Ivan says he actually told some friends exactly what he was planning to do. To others, he gave vague warnings to avoid the school lobby that morning. He talked to me like in a regular tone saying, yeah, Wilson, something's going to happen. Just go up to the library. And and he made it sound like he was going to come up there and talk to us. I thought it was just going to be a big fight. If a friend hears another friend announcing a plan to commit some violence, they should take that seriously and not stop to try to determine is it one of those times where they're really going to follow through or not. It's better to be safe than sorry when you see any of these warning signs. There comes a time when you can hold stuff and you can be buddies and not narc or tattle or whatever, but then if you can hurt someone, for yourself, you know, that someone needs to know you need to be stopped because it's not right. Don't hold back if you hear something's going on. Just find somebody who can help them. If you can't handle it, then take it to somebody else who can. It doesn't have to be somebody who's connected with your friend. It has to be somebody you trust who can then try to get your friend some help. For young people who feel like they're in similar situations and they're on the verge of doing something, what do you say to them? Say, hey, 
pain. There's, there's no pain in the world like knowing that you took somebody's life. I've got to go every day just knowing that it's, it's just really messed up. What advice would you give them? The situation now, even though it's bad, the aftermath is even worse. I mean, you have to tell somebody, even though it may seem that there's nobody that cares. There is, there is somebody that does care. And I realized that too late.